Sports FM broadcasting from Mar. Um, so uh, today we'll kick off with um, Adelaide United results so far this season in the A League. Um, they've had a pretty good start to the season. Um, they're sitting uh, third on the ladder, equal on points with Melbourne Victory and Sydney FC. And um, they're unbeaten so far this year as well. So they've uh, won three games and had two draws. And um, they've played some pretty good teams as well. So they played, uh, they've already played Sydney FC and Melbourne Victory inside the first five games to apparently first and second on that. So, um, so they've got a good chance of uh, um, maintaining their position on the ladder with um, some probably easier games coming up later in the, um, later in the year. Um, and also their crowds have been extremely good as well. So they had uh, 33,000 at Adelaide Oval against Melbourne Victory and um, on Friday night um, at uh, Highmark Stadium against Sydney FC, uh, they had 16,000, which was the third largest crowd ever at Highmark Stadium for an Adelaide United um, A-League match. So um, things are looking up for the, um, the local soccer team here in South Australia. Yeah, they are. It's a very good morning to everyone out there. They are looking uh, pretty good uh, at yeah, the start of the season. The, the form's been um, pretty nice. Um, they have probably um, converted a lot of their chances they would have liked to. Um, especially on Friday night, they had a host of chances. They probably had around 15 to 20 shots um, on the night and uh, just couldn't convert any, especially in the last opportunity in about the last two minutes of the game. Um, completely scuffed the shot, which was, uh, you know, Almost an open net for them, so um, it was pretty frustrating. And I was I was there on Friday night too, and the atmosphere was pretty good, um, especially in the last sort of twenty or so minutes when um, uh, the Reds were sort of storming home. Um, and I'm sure the club would be extremely happy that uh, they're not only with their position on the ladder, but the fact that they're able to clean the crowds. Um, currently, they're averaging seventeen thousand per game. So, uh, uh, and to get the third highest crowd ever for. Um, and I think that's would be pretty pleasing. Oh, absolutely. No, it definitely would be. Um, so, uh, yeah, coming up, they've got um, matches against... Uh, let's have a look here. Just a sec. Um, they've got matches against Wellington, Central Coast Mariners, um, and then Melbourne Victory away. So, the next two matches, they would be pretty confident of getting a victory. Um, the Phoenix are at home. Uh, so, another big match coming up, and then they play the Mariners away. The Mariners have been in pretty um, poor form lately, so um, you have to think that they would be pretty confident of getting um, possibly another two victories um, coming up. If they can convert their chances, then uh, um, things are looking really, you know, strong and bright for the team um, uh, later in the year. So um, after that, we'll, uh, we'll go into a promo and then we'll um, discuss the recent cricket results in um, the UAE and the T20s. At the and the MCG. In the action, every choice you make has a huge impact. You've got to make the right decisions. If you want to be a game changer, you can't afford to take unnecessary risks or rush into something that you might regret. Whether you're in heavy traffic or you've got room to move, you still have to be in complete control. Just one decision, one small thing, one lapse in concentration, and your whole world could change. Uh, welcome back, everyone. Um, obviously, the recent results for the Australian cricket side have been pretty disappointing, especially over um, overseas in the UAE um, against Pakistan. And um, after uh, Australia had Pakistan at two for nine, I think in the first innings of the first Test match, everything went pear shaped after that, and um, Pakistan completely obliterated us um, in both Test matches and uh, won very, very convincingly, especially in the second Test where they won by um, about 350 runs. So uh, um, I think um, a lot of people are sort of saying that they should discount these results because they're being played on pitches that, you know, Australia aren't used to. But um, to remind you, I would have thought that um, if you wanted to be one of the best test teams in, in the world, you want to be um, able to compete on, you know, in any conditions against any side and... Um, the fact that they wilted so easily um, is pretty concerning, I would have thought. You know, the, the team they selected didn't really do much damage. Um, they had quite a few batsmen out of form, and Mitchell Johnson was probably really the only bowler that looked at all threatening at all, and um, even he struggled in the second test. So uh, um, 
there would be quite a few concerns for the Australian side coming up for the, um, I mean, maybe not the, the test matches coming up because they're back in Australia, but if they ever have to travel again, um, you know, to India or Bangladesh or any of those subcontinent nations, um, they're going to have to lift their game and come up with some probably better spin bowlers and also just um, lift their form with the bat as well. Yeah, who, I think we've talked about this before. Who do you think could come in as a potential um, spin bowler? Yeah, it's difficult to say because I just don't think the depth there at that moment is good enough. Um, uh, you've got, they could try, um, uh, they've got Adam Zamba who's doing okay for South Australia. Um, they could bowl Steve Smith a bit more, they didn't seem to use him that much, um, uh, in the match against Pakistan. Um, but you just have to think that the, yeah, that probably, it's not about maybe changing the side right now, it's about developing players that are going to be good enough in, Five years time. So, um, I think we've got a few, um, uh, fast paced bowlers that we could bring to the side. Um, they might need a bit more, uh, preparation and sort of, um, match practice like, uh, Patrick Cummins or Shane Watson and also, um, James Patterson. They're probably the three players that you could see play for Australia again. Um, cause, uh, Peter Siddle and, Mitch Marsh didn't really do much with the ball. Mitch Marsh was okay with the bat. Um, but a lot of our bowling figures were really disappointing. Um, so we saw in the second innings where, uh, Pakistan declared at, uh, 3, 293. Um, Mitchell Johnson had two wickets, but even his economy rate was six runs and over. Um, Lyon didn't take a wicket. Stark didn't take a wicket. Still didn't take a wicket. So you had, you know, two of our, two of our main fast bowlers, um, went wickedless in the second innings. And in the first innings when Pakistan made almost 600 runs, um, you had Stark two for 86, which is not too bad, but Siddle one for 75, so you're pretty disappointed with that. Um, Marsh wickedless. Um, so, you know, pretty concerning figures, I would think, for the bowling. Um, uh, on the side at the moment, so they're going to have to lift their game, or they're going to have to hope that some of the players that aren't in the side at the moment um, are able to work their way back into the team and possibly perform at a higher level. Um, and I don't think these results have been sort of one-off either. Um, we've seen some of the, um, especially Pierce Hill, who's you know had some good results um, maybe a year ago, but. Some of the recent test matches have been pretty disappointing. Um, outside of Mitch Johnson, yeah, the the strike bowlers have been, you know, not as good as what we would hope for. So, uh, um, yeah, there's a few concerns leading into both the test matches and then maybe even World Cup um, in three or four months' time. Yes. <coughs> Right no, yes, yep. yeah. um, no, exactly. It would be a concern uh, with the South African test, and then, as you said, with the World Cup so close, and yeah. especially being played on Australian soil. Would you? Yeah, I think they'd be pretty confident playing back at home because um, we seem to be, you know, far more dangerous um, on our wickets. But um, yeah, I think when we play overseas, especially um, on the drier. The drier pitches, um, we seem to struggle a bit. So, um, we'll discuss the 2020 matches as well. And it's, it's difficult to say that Australia would improve their results because, um, the 2020 side is basically completely different to the test team. So, um, with the 2020 results, really the only player that, um, Australia has brought back in from the test team was, um, uh, who was coming back? I think Gray Maxwell played the last match. That's um, right. So he's pretty much the only player that has come back from the test team that is currently competing in the T20. So, um, so far it's won all in that 2020 series. Uh, and both teams have won fairly convincingly in both matches. So Australia smashed out in the last one, um, reaching South Africa's small total of 101 in just 12 overs. So, um, that was a fairly one-sided affair. And, but in the previous, in the first 2020, um, Australia 
uh, posted a fairly mediocre total of 140. Yet. South Africa chased that down with an over the set. So um, there's one point twenty left, and uh, um, and that's tonight. Yes, it is tonight. Yeah. So um, I think uh, Cricket Australia might be concerned about the the crowd at twenty twenty two. So because um, they had twenty six thousand at Adelaide Oval, which is probably not too bad. Um, considering, you know, Adelaide Oval under, under its previous configuration, 26,000 would look pretty impressive. Very um, The 21,000 that attended at the MCG um, is probably pretty pretty poor, and um, Australia, you know, maybe pre Australia need to treat this T20 a bit more seriously, because um, the, the team that's, you know, currently in play in these 2020s is fairly, um, yeah. Like not be great, but just none of the players are uh, what you consider high profile players that play 20, that play the test team, the test matches all the time. So, because um, uh, you know, you haven't got players like David Warner or uh, Mark Clark, uh, Mitchell Johnson, like all those players would be playing the 2020s if they were treating them, you know, with 100% um, commitment. So, I think that's probably one of the factors that the the fans don't really want to attend when it's, you know, a big grade team, I guess. Um, so whether they, um, you know, force their players to play the T20s more often or schedule them a bit later in the year because, um, you know, people are still at work during November and um, a lot of the kids, you know, are still at school or whatnot. So it's probably not the greatest, you know, when you can consider the schedule. And the team, the, the, the two teams that are playing, um, in regards to who's lining up for them, uh, probably doesn't really result in a great crowd. So um, I think we'll see some, you know, some solid crowds during the Test series against India and the World Cup. Um, I think they'll, you know, they'll be fine there. And the Big Bash, you know, seems to always um, it's fairly popular amongst, you know, uh, the younger fans. So. Uh, because they managed to get around 20,000 at Adelaide Oval um, for the big bash last year when Adelaide Oval was still there to the pick it, so um, redeveloped. So under the new, you know, under the full redevelopment, you have to think that they might be able to push towards 30,000 maybe? I'm not really sure. Oh, I'd say so, I mean, pretty close. Yeah, yeah. Sure was. so uh, I mean, you saw it at 2020 that the crowd was 26,000, but um, almost two thirds of that crowd was the, yeah, the SAC members. So the, the member the member stand was full. Um, look, look pretty full to me. Um, so we're going to have to work towards maybe getting more people that aren't the members to the game. So um, there's the east the eastern stand, the Riverbank stand look pretty empty um, on TV. So yes. um, if they're pushing towards thirty thousand or more, um, they might want to you know maybe reduce the prices. I'm not sure, but um, clearly the the ticketing prices probably were a little bit of a concern. So, um, you know, that might have to be an issue for them. So, um, so are you going to say? Oh, I'm just going to say, do you, do you think they'll have the uh, flamethrowers no, tonight? No, like um, I think they've um, banned them or removed them for the upcoming game. So, uh, that would be embarrassing for Free Australia, I would think. And, um, and poor Aaron Finch. Poor oh, Aaron Finch as well, yeah. So, I mean, it was the. You would have thought that by the by the way that he calls and sort of was hesitant to approach the the fireworks or whatever you want to call it, that they wouldn't let them set them off, and it just makes it look pretty amateur, really. So uh, you have to think. Um, I think they did announce that they were going to scrap them for the upcoming game. So, right. Uh-huh. Um, and you know, it was so so silly that um, it was even um, discussed on ESPN over in America. So, uh, oh wow! Yeah, so, right. So I think once you, if things like cricket or Australian rules football um, get covered, you know, overseas, uh, generally it's either for something that's very impressive or something that's pretty cringeworthy. And uh, unfortunately, uh, yeah, Aaron Finch got pretty scared by it. I don't think anyone would be pretty scared, and um, it made it look pretty silly as well. So uh, oh, definitely, yeah. Hopefully, maybe cricket Australia puts more focus on the. Instead of the, um, you know, off the ground entertainment that they seem to be pushing for all these 2020s. 
Yes, so um, they had some guy on the stage on the big bike and I didn't really see him. Yeah, so, I mean, they, I think they need, they might need to do something to bring in sort of the non cricket crowd, but a lot of the stuff seems to be so gimmicky that, um, yeah, I'm not sure how that would be effective. Um, I remember going to a few of the T20 games, um, one of the Gather and a few of the LA Strikers, and um, I mean, I, I like my cricket, but at the same time, it just, some of the some of the music in the background seemed to be so loud, and it was played between every ball that it just seemed so excessive that you know it was almost more annoying than actually entertaining. So uh, um, maybe the market research suggests that um, that stuff works, but um, as a cricket bowler, it's, it's a little bit annoying and a bit gimmicky. So uh, oh, I have to and agree. especially the plane cross stuff, which is you know, it's almost dangerous. So like, yeah. So uh, oh yeah. Yeah, so well, you've got to think not only for the players, but for the um, the crowd that are right on the boundary fence. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and I think that's you know I heard a few people saying that when they're on the boundary, um, you know, it's actually quite hot. Um, you know, when that thing goes off. So uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, it would be interesting to see if they ever brought it back. And I don't think that would necessarily all of the um, public humiliation they caught for it. So now, do you think that will flow through to the Big Bash? Um, oh, the Big Bash will still have all the, you know, the razzmatazz of the you know, dancing people and the trampoline or whatever. And, um, they'll probably still have the music as well, I would say. But it'd be nice if they maybe down, you know, um, reduce the amount of music that they use. Um, I think they've still got a place there, but playing it between every ball was a bit excessive for me. Um, but I would think that the, if they're going to have the fireworks, um, keep it, you know, away from the crowd and away from the boundary. Um, so, you know, like grounds like the MCG where they bring the boundary are quite far in, um, they can have the fireworks, you know, in a spot where it's not really close to either the fans or the players. But at the other level where um, the boundary broke on the eastern and western side of the ground um, is so close to the boundary that it's almost, yeah, it's, it's impossible to... Um, or silly to hold the fireworks in those positions. So I guess it depends on the ground, but um, yeah, you'd think it could Australia probably wouldn't bring it back anytime soon. So um, we'll lead into a song and then we'll discuss the, um, the Crow's new flash music that was released on Friday. Long no, so are you. seems to hear your cry and you stop this race against the world but you you know the only way the only way is to tell the truth You are not afraid, are not afraid, are not afraid, but now that everyone sleeps, Taste and 
um, the Australian market would be so small for them that there isn't really that incentive for them to sponsor AFL sides anymore. Um, so organisations like BLK, um, you know, you probably see them more and more um, in the AFL from now on. So uh, um, the class strip design would have been submitted by the pros quite a while ago. Um, there was uh, a post from Big Footy, which is a Aussie Rules Forum site that knew the design back in September. So um, uh, the design was pretty much known for at least two or three months now, and you'd have to think they would have submitted it probably to the AFL oh, a good six to 12 months ago. So uh, um, that would have happened before the new pro CEO came in. So uh, whether, um, you know, the Andrew Fagan actually had a different view or not, uh, I'm not really sure, but the fact that he did tweet and say that he welcomes the feedback and, you know, there'll be a push towards a more fan consultation session in regards to designing the new strip um, in a few years' time um, suggests that maybe he disagrees with what uh, the previous administration did. So uh, um, I'm not sure what you think, Darren, in regards to um, AFL uniforms these days, but, uh, yeah, I'm pretty frustrated with the way the pros... Yes. Just looking at the top, the Crows website up the I Crows website up now, I'm just looking at a picture. I can see it clashing with a number of teams. Um, yes. I think the Crows do all right in regards to still avoiding any sort of possible clash um, compared to, say, Richmond, who have a clash jump that is literally just their home game with a bit of extra yellow slap on it. Um, so you hear all the time that the AFL say, oh, they, they only commit white jumps now, but... Um, you know, a few clubs to extend the breakout rules. So uh, um, I think the pro for a game in regards to uh, avoiding a clash, mm -hmm. but the designs that they use are so tacky. That oh, they are. Yeah. It's good that the umpires now wear fluoro yellow or fluoro green. Oh, exactly, yeah. And they would clash. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, I mean, the, I, I quite, I endorse the, you know, the, the move towards having all the away teams in a, in a in uniform that, doesn't clash with the home jumper. Um, you still see these days in big matches like Carlton, Collingwood, or even the showdown here in Adelaide, where um, if it's deemed to be like a, a big, a big match, uh, the away team still seems to wear their home jumper, um, which seems a bit silly these days, considering the away uniform is available for all sides. Exactly. But then you look at what happened with Port Power, and they weren't going to be able to wear their. What did they do? Well, exactly, yeah. yeah. So, um, because as I said, like Richmond's home, Richmond's away jumper is, uh, is basically their home jersey with some yellow panels on the side. So, um, uh, they didn't deem that Richmond's away jumper was appropriate. And I think that just shows that the April, April's policy is so, um, hypocritical in that some teams are forced to wear white all the time. Like the pros are, the pros wear white every second week, basically. Um, and other teams like Carlton and Collingwood, whenever they play each other, um, they never force to wear their away jumper. So uh, the double standards across the league happen all the time. And um, not only are uh, you know it's frustrating for the pros, they seem to embrace the traditional looking design, but the fact that the the rules seem to apply to some teams and others is also something that is just pretty frustrating as a as a supporter and. You saw the, the situation for the, the final between Port and Richmond where Port were originally forced to wear their away jersey and that also happened between West Coast and Richmond as well where West Coast were forced to wear their white jumper. So, um, yeah, the, the AFL needs to be far stricter in applying the policy and if they are to have a policy that they should actually use it. So, uh, um, it'd be interesting to see if Richmond do come up with a new away jumper. They should. Um, and it'd be pretty odd of the AFL to make such a hullabaloo over the fact that their away jump wasn't appropriate this year and then to not force them to come up with something new next year. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's one of the areas that the AFL are probably struggling the most, I would think. Um, the, you know, they, they talk about integrity and, uh, and whatnot, and yet they can't, they can't get a very simple policy um, correct uh, most of the time. So uh, it's really interesting to see what happens next year. Um, yeah, it will be. We'll have the picture of the um, away goonsie up on our Facebook, uh, Facebook 
slash facebook.com slash osports.online. We'd love to hear your feedback, so go to our Facebook and leave your, fa- uh, leave your feedback. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Um, so uh, after, uh, after a song, we'll uh, discuss the, uh, the ongoing LA review. Had fifty-five thousand members. 
um, they would not be posting, you know, such a massive loss for both. Uh, the Powell, you know, seem to be uh, looking ahead to, and the Crows only, you know, managing a very small profit or possibly only breaking even. So um, I think probably the main issue is the fact that, uh, yes, the, the, the two AFL teams probably aren't getting enough um, revenue out of the stadium deal, and the fact that the SMA only budgeted for far lower crowds than what they actually, than what actually occurred, and the SMA seems to have benefited um, almost, ex almost you know, exclusively by the, the massive crowd. So, um, Port and the Crows had their uplift by their expected averages and didn't seem to get any benefit from the big crowds that occurred afterwards. So, um, but when you have so many different parties that are trying to pick off at um, the pie, I guess you would call it, uh, where you've got the SMA, the SNFL, uh, Crows, Port, um, I'm not sure if Saffron were involved, but I mean, you've got four different parties all trying to um, receive revenue from, you know, one oval, from one stadium, um, that creates difficulty, doesn't it? So, Ah, oh, definitely. Yeah, so you've got, yeah. Like, you've got other you've got other teams, you know, like Geelong, for example, probably think best example where I think they actually own their their venue. So they always get all the benefits from, you know, their match day um, uh, experience. And, uh, you know, they can have a crowd of 25,000 and make half a million dollars. So um, uh, the Crows and Port really need to finalise this deal, and both teams are fairly unhappy with uh, the Crows didn't seem to be very vocal about it before, you know, during the Stephen Trigg era. They, they did express disappointment, but they didn't seem to be as vocal as what Port did. But um, with Andrew Fagan now in the chair, um, they have been fairly um, uh, critical of the, the deal that's currently in place, and uh, they seem to be suggesting that they're actually quite a fair way off from even reaching a deal, which is quite concerning considering the season. The yeah, upcoming season is only, you know, three or four months away. So um, you can't have um, attendances that, the, that, that have occurred um, and not really some sort of reward. So, you know, you, 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 you can imagine that, um, you know, a lot of people in Melbourne would look at the other level and think, gee, they're getting such massive crowds and they're averaging almost 50,000 per week. And um, both teams can't even make a profit. So, uh, um, you know, both a lot of people around Australia will be looking at that and thinking this is pretty fastful. And um, uh, while the fan experience has been improved and more people have been able to go to the game, but if the pros and power can't even um, take advantage of the massive crowds that are occurring, then you'd almost say that the move from 80 stadiums to other level is made. Not relevant, but um, the whole point of moving to the new stadium was so that they could uh, get a financial uplift, and that doesn't seem to be occurring at the moment. So mm -hmm. it'd be interesting to see when the, the review is actually finalised here, you know, whether it's soon or whether it still takes another month or two. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, pretty concerning for both teams, I would think. Oh, definitely, definitely. Yeah. And with Port and the Crows when they shut the yeah, showdown, moving back to Footy Park. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, I think um, Kane Williams was on 5AA when they were discussing the fixture, and he was saying that both teams were um, wanting to, they didn't really be, they're not really concerned about staying at home, um, but the AFL, the AFL seemed to, you know, the AFL are very keen in regards to their pre-season fixture and having all the teams playing their home state in the last round of the NAP fixture. So um, West Coast are playing Fremantle, Gold Coast are playing Brisbane, the Crows are playing Port. So all the in-state players are playing the against each other. Um, but uh, yeah, Kane Collins was saying that both clubs wanting to uh, play with as close to match conditions as possible and have the best facilities available as well. So obviously Adelaide isn't available at that time because it's a group World Cup. Um, but, you know, venues like Cooks, uh, like Nord Oval or Alberton or Glenelg Oval, 
you know, some of the SA NFL grounds um, probably weren't appropriate for uh, the final round of the fixture because of the fact that they're only two weeks away from starting the NFL season. So, well, that's interesting you say that because. I think it was this now cup this year. They played a game at um, Sydney Webster, West Adelaide's home ground. Yeah, so I mean, they, they, um, they're, I think they're both teams are happy to play at regional grounds in round one and two of the that, but they want to play at, you know, an AFL specific venue or as, you know, obviously any given an AFL venue anymore, but um, it had been for 25 years. So, yes, uh, yeah. Um, so, yeah, I think that's why they want to play at Amy's Day. Well, they want to play at an actual venue in the last round, but, um, you know, from, from the talk that both teams are saying, they, they've never been keen on playing a, a showdown in the pre-season, or, you know, a mini showdown, um, and yet the AFL continue to schedule it that way, so. That's what's going to ask next. Do you think the AFL should have worked with Cricket Australia and maybe moved to NAB Cup later on after the World Cup, so like, say, LA would, would be available? Uh, well, I mean, the, the AFL have already pushed their season back um, a few weeks so that the season starts after the Cricket World Cup is finished. So I think logistically it would be too difficult to schedule a pre-season game at that level. But um, it is a little bit... Uh, while the clubs might be fine, well, so while the football department and the players might be fine with playing that stadium, I think from a sort of an image point of view when um, the fans don't really want to, I don't think the fans would be very, very keen on going back to any stadium. Um, you know, Adelaide Oval is obviously the new era and while the clubs need to make more money from it, um, clearly it's a massive, um, it's been a massive winner for, you know, the state and uh, uh, the fans. So um, going back to any stadium is probably not the greatest message to sell. No, when uh, that was being so popular. And you've got to wonder how much of the facilities probably have to redo the facilities because they haven't been used for months. And yeah, I'm not, sure. Stuff and yeah I'm not sure that they've been um, left alone and therefore that they have deteriorated a bit over the past 12 months. But I mean, they did have a few um, uh, SNFL under 18 matches where um, during the AFL under 18 carnival was on. So they had a few matches at AMC then. So, um, and they also had, uh, I'm not sure if it goes to change or not, but they did have um, the, um, like the monster trucks or whatever at AMC. That's right, yes. Yeah. So yeah. Um, they've had a few events now. And also they've got um, the One Direction concert, I think, there a few months time as well. So um, AMC is still being used a bit in regards to concerts and whatnot, but Obviously, as a football venue, this might be the last time it's ever used from an animal perspective. So, I right. didn't think that the cricket ball cap was a unique uh, scenario for the AFL, um, and they're not going to have to deal with this outside of 2015 for the next 20 or 30 years. With it. So, uh, um, yeah, and we have to think of any pre season matches from 2016 onwards will be either at a regional ground or at a so um, I think this might be just a one-off uh, issue that the clubs just have to sort of put up with them, I guess. Right, okay. <laughs> yeah, so um, we'll uh, lead you to a promo and then we'll uh, discuss uh, yesterday's SA Good Home results. <laughs> For nearly four decades, Adelaide's Cold Chisel have defined Australian rock and roll. Their last national tour was the biggest ever by an Australian band. Anybody wants to uh, join in the audience? Their music, like their appeal, is totally timeless. Check it out.
Australia's greatest band, performing the anthems that have become part of Australian culture. Marking their 40th anniversary, Cold Chisel play a once-in-a-lifetime exclusive South Australian performance. Sunday, March 1st, 2015. Clipsal 500 Adelaide is proud to welcome home the legendary Cold Chisel. And welcome back. You're listening to Old Sports FM with Henry and we're sort of like Darren. And of course, it's gridiron season here in South Australia, and we've got the results from yesterday's two games and the two really good games and two different results, but uh, two very good games. It wasn't really touchdowns um, put on, but it was still very good offense and defense by the, the four teams. And in the first game, it was the Port Adelaide Spartans versus the Southern District Oilers. And we had our first draw for the season. Both teams getting the 12, putting the 12 ball on the board. And our second game of the day, so the Eastside Racebacks take on the Uni SA Eagles. Eastside Racebacks coming into yesterday's game with an unbeaten record. And they continued that still rolling with the UDSA Eagles 7 to 0. And as I said, that game didn't really have many touchdowns, but it was just really excellent defence and a really good offence by the, by the four teams. So it was a 12 all draw from the Port LA Spartans and the Southern District Oilers. And in the second game, it was the Eastside Racebacks continuing their unbeaten record over the UDSA Eagles 7 to 0. And that's the gridiron. And we're going to have some very exciting news coming up in the next couple of weeks in regards to a partnership that Oz Sports is, will be forming with a local educational in, um, place here, um, institution, I should say, an educational institution in South Australia. I won't say too much more. But we'll, be, we'll make sure we keep you up to date on that and we'll, talk and we'll be launching that partnership. And along with that, All Sports Online Network is also diversifying and we're going to have our own online sports merchandise store. That will be coming online probably mid-December to early January and we're looking at stocking gridiron merchandise from the five gridiron teams in South Australia in their own uh, gridiron range, our own merchandise range, and hopefully we'll be looking at some NFL gear. So if you want to get hold of some excellent merchandise from the five gridiron teams in South Australia, or maybe some NFL gear, or even uh, some of our own range, then make sure you keep um, keep your eye on, on All Sports Facebook or on the All Sports website for more news when that all comes about. But we'll be making sure we keep you up to date on our partnership agreement. That's going to be very exciting. Well, that brings our show to an end today. It's been great to have you tuned in. We'll be back next weekend or next week. We're not really sure. We're still trying to find our group when the whole team can get together. So. Just keep your eye on the Osports Facebook, but we'll definitely be back sometime next week. My name's Darren. Uh, hi, I'm Henry here, and uh, thanks for tuning in, and we'll see you next week.